Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. I'll just get right into this, this issue for this hour, and that is the fact that uh, uh, a couple of nights ago, uh, the last high noon meeting, uh, they were talking about some of the issues on the island, normally norm, basically called, identified as Jansen Beach or Hayden Island or whatever. But the fact of the is there are some major issues there sitting on the, on the, uh, in, the, in that area. And one of the major discussion was the whole issue of the Columbia River crossing. And, um, and so there were, it was quite an interesting meeting. Uh, uh, Tiffany Couch, uh, you might have remembered her. She, she also was here on the show some time ago. She's a, she's a, a, a forensic auditor, if you will, just basically checking the books. And she was here. She, she brought out some issues that we were, we were very interested in and some other folks were very interested on the island. And, uh, and also there was an alternative bridge uh, they talked about at the at the uh, at that particular meeting well what we want to do today is that um, we've got with us one of the board members um, uh, mr. Cashel uh, and he's going to be basically talking about uh, uh, what he what his response was in reference to the presentation by Tiffany couch and Jim Howell who presented the, the, the alternative to the bridge aspect of it let me start off by doing it this way uh, there was an article in the Oregonian. There were many couple of articles here, but there was an article in the Oregonian, and but better yet, it was a letter to the editor. It was kind of kind of lays it out for us real quick. I'll read this real quick, and I'll be very brief. It said, "Why is the Columbia River crossing not dead? Since the last reporting of the CRC spending at 170 million dollars, the Washington funding was not approved. But the CRC seems to have had another 10 million to spend, and spending is more than 180 million without a final plan." Without approval by all of the regulatory stakeholders and without financial support from Washington, and still the project is showing no signs of shutting down. How much more in this seemingly endless pot of gold? Enough is enough. We have more urgent public needs for our monies. Nathan R. Keith, Northeast Portland. As you can see, there's a major concern, and I.E. taxpayers, I'm sure, are very much concerned because a lot of this money is just going basically, and people don't know what's going on. So you'll learn a little bit more when Tiffany talks a little bit about this as she makes her presentation at this high noon meeting. And, uh, and so we'll just go from there. But joining me, uh, joining me from the board from the high noon, again, like I said, is Herman Cashel. And uh, Herman, I guess there's some other issues there also on the island. Yeah, we have a lot of issues on the island. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we we're right in the middle of the West Hayden Island industrial development where the city would annex the part of West Hayden Island and uh, in the future, probably 15, 20 years down the road, they do some sort of an industrial development there. Okay. Mainly it would be a transfer station, be product coming in, product going out. Uh, have no idea what that would be at yeah. this time. It's mm -hmm. just future planning. Uh, there's also, uh, of course, Lottery Row has been in the news lately. Right. We've got that going on. We've got a change in, uh, in the uh, lottery chairman now. He's going to, a new person is coming to that post. Uh, we've got the South Par Bay project that doesn't get hardly any press at all, which is on the east end of the island, off of Tomahawk Island Drive, going to be a huge influx of people on the island and virtually no way to get them off mm -hmm. onto the island because of the two-lane Tomahawk Island Drive. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got a lot of issues going on, and uh, it's tough. <laughs> well, hey, I hear you. And, and in fact, on, on that particular note, what we're going to be discussing is that as time goes on, we're going to probably be talking about each of these ind these issues individually. Right. And Herman, hopefully you will come on and sure. hopefully talk about these pieces. You also mentioned when we were off, off the air that you were mentioned that the, as I read this piece about the $10 million to spend and whatever at $180 million, that you had some concerns about whether the figure was correct. You said well, you it's uh, interesting. The Columbia... Uh, well, I'm at week on the on just fr uh, on the 14th, um, mm -hmm. a few days ago, they uh, in the U.S. District Court, uh, they had claimed at at in September in this lawsuit this uh, they're working through that they had 60 million to keep planning right up to the point of groundbreaking. Wow! Wow! So wow. you know where'd that come from? Okay, so that's that's one of the reasons why folks with there's so uh, many questions around exactly. Columbia River Crossing. Right, it's right. Amazing. So what we're gonna do is get a better feel of that piece. We're gonna now play the the. Uh, the presentation by Tiffany Couch in the front of High Noon, 
which was the last meeting, right? Right, on Thursday. Me. On Thursday, this past Thursday. Okay, fine. Let's, let's look at the video. Good evening. We've got a good crowd here. I'm Tiffany Couch. Um, and I'm, I've been asked to kind of talk to you all about what kind of work we did uh, involving the Columbia River Crossing Project. Our work spanned a little more than two years and the analysis of, of over 30,000 documents, all of which came from either, most of which came from the CRC Project Office, some came from Washington State Department of Transportation and others came from the Oregon Department of Transportation. And I've got like all kinds of angles here, so I'm going to do my best to, to, to talk to all of you. Um, so there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot that we did in those two years and I'm happy to take questions. I'm going to try to move really quickly. I see a lot of familiar faces, um, so some of it a lot of it will probably not be new to you, although I've got one small update after having attended a conference back in Washington, D.C. a few weeks ago that I thought was really enlightening to these sorts of projects in, in general. So I'd like to re remind me to share that with you at the end. So a lot of people don't understand what a forensic accountant is, and, and by the way, that's what I do. I own a forensic accounting firm in Vancouver, Washington. Um, most of my clients hire me when they think somebody's stealing from them, and I'm basically a financial investigator. I go through and figure out what happened, what did they do, um, and I turn over my work to the police or to the insurance company and try and get money back for my client. I also get involved in contract disputes, marital disputes, testify in court as an expert. Um, and, and then a big part of what I do is I speak around the country on forensic accounting or fraud topics and that sort of thing. So I, I kind of like to say, you know, I'm not v Vancouver's forensic accountant. I'm a forensic accountant who happens to live in Vancouver. And so uh, I, I work with a lot of great clients all over the United States. And, and one of my favorite things to do is teach people and talk to people. So I appreciate you all being here tonight. Um, I'm not going to bore you with all of the details of what the CRC is, because I think most of us in this room know what the CRC project is. So I'm going to skip that slide. Um, and move into how we got involved. Because I think there's a big misunderstanding there. Um, my client uh, was David Medore. He is now a county commissioner, but two years ago, in, in April of 2011, he was a, a private citizen, much like all of you. He owned a business in, um, in Vancouver, and he was reading the newspaper. He was reading the Columbian, and, and right about that time was the period of time when we, all, we heard that the bridge could not be built. Remember that you know, the design was one that couldn't be built. And he's an engineer, and he, he said, well, why in the world have we spent $108 million and we can't build the bridge? And he, he called them up or emailed them, I really don't really know, uh, but he said, send me information on where all this money is gone. And so they did. Uh, the CRC project office, which is right here in Vancouver, sent him 724 electronic, what we call PDF files, and each of those 724 files had more than 1,000 pieces of paper in them. So he was literally given more than 10,000 documents. And they said, here is the information on how much money we've spent. So he called, somebody told him, you need to call Tiffany. She's a forensic accountant. And he called me and he said, can you go through these documents and tell me where all the money's been spent? And I said, no, you do not want to pay me to do that. I said, you're dealing with a government agency. They don't, call, they don't call financial reports the same thing we do in private business. Let's just, let's just ask them for the right things. And he said, you would do that? And I said, yeah, just pay for a couple hours of my time, and we'll get the right documents. I'll hand them to you. I'll explain what they say, and then I'll go back to all my other clients, and you can go at, back to your business. And he said, great, I have a meeting with them in a couple of weeks. Can you come with me? And I said, sure, I'll go with you. So he and I show up at the pre-allotted time, and 14 people there are there to meet us. In my world, that's a big red flag, right? Why are 14 people there to meet him and I, and we're just there to ask a couple of questions about where all the money's been spent? Long story short, they told us at that meeting that they were unable to print out any documents that would show what I call a job cost report. Who, you know, how much money were each of these vendors paid, right? I just kind of wanted to understand where that money went. And they said their accounting system was unable to uh, produce any sort of report 
that would tell us where all the money was had been spent. And they also would, could not tell me at the time where any of the money they used had come from. So they gave me a, an Excel spreadsheet with 30,000 lines of data and said, here you go, and you have the 10,000 documents already, and um, have fun. And they could not literally uh, tell me where all the money had been spent. So that's how I got involved. And we walked out of there, and he said, well, they were really nice. And I said, they were nice people, but we, we've got some big red flags here. You know, we can't print a report. We've got 14 people meeting us, and I'm a little bit on high alert. Um, and he said, will you go through the documents and that data? And I did. And what I found by going just through that data and summarizing it in a way that told me who got paid was at that time uh, they had already gone up to $132 million. And of that $132 million at the time, 80, sorry, 79, 77 million had gone to one vendor, uh, which was David Evans and Associates. And about that time, $17 million was unknown. And at this point, we're over $20 million that didn't have any moniker or any notation of who got that money. So at that point in time, I had 70% of the money to one vendor, um, a, a, a smaller percentage, but 20 million, we had no idea where it went to. And uh, we started asking more questions. And out of asking those questions, we issued a series of six reports which I, I brought here today. Um, all of my reports are based on Columbia River Crossing Project documents. Um, you know, I don't, I don't print out a bunch of projections or anything else. I just say, here's, their here's the questions I asked, here's the documents that they sent over, and here are, are the reasons why I have questions. And so I've gotten six different reports <coughs> issued that spell out pretty significant questions. The first one is the only non-accounting or non-financial related report, um, but because it was so significant, I couldn't not tell the legislators what happened. And so that was a big part of what I was doing, was telling the public officials, where, whether it was the city council or whether it was the county commissioners or whether it was um, CTRAN or the state legislatures in both states, Here's what these documents are telling me, and here's why there's questions. And the Open Public Meetings Act was really because I kept going to these meetings, and the CRC project office was saying, we have this project sponsors council, and they started meeting in 2008. And I said, I kept, I kept going, well, no, I have all of this information on a project sponsors council that met in 05 and 06, and they made all of the decisions on what the project was going to be. And they made the decision on, you know, the fact of what the locally preferred alternative was, that it was going to be a bridge with a certain number of lanes, and it was going to have a light rail and not bus rapid transit and that sort of thing. And so as I started asking more questions, they gave us a data dump on the Project Sponsors Council, and as part of that, we got an internal memo. And an internal memo is basically a memo between staff members within an office, right? And that internal memo um, was very important because it talked about how the project office was going to manage the public officials. And it talks about how they're going to work the public officials prior to each meeting. And it says, indicates that they want to work the public officials so that there will not be any deliberations during the meeting. And it also indicates that they're going to only have minimum public notice for a meeting so that a uh, public participation would be minimized. And that's all in their own writing, in their own documents. So I issued that report to uh, the legislature back in October of 2012 <coughs> saying, hey, listen, what they're telling you about this Project Sponsors Council is not true, and here's the documents to prove it. And oh, by the way, I'm concerned about uh, this draft internal memo and how they were wanting to work the process at the very, very beginning in 2005 when the project office opened. So that was report number one. Report number two is sort of a beast. And it, it basically, I asked for all of the information on the contract on that one contract with David Evans and Associates. Now remember, at the time they'd been paid about $80 million, or that's what I knew they had been paid. <coughs> um, so I got the contract. And the contract was very interesting. It said, hey, Washington State Department of Transportation, <laughs> we, David Evans, 
for $50 million are going to give you a draft environmental impact statement, a final environmental impact statement, and get you all the way through the record of decision, and we're going to do it for $50 million under a contract that says maximum amount payable. Okay? Maximum amount payable generally means $50 million is the max, right? Well, remember, I had all of this spending data that had already indicated that they'd been paid nearly $80 million. <coughs> And so I was showing the legislature all of the information in regards to um, this contract and that they were signing uh, their first amendment to the contract was two pages and it gave them 45 million additional dollars on the contract. It did not change the deliverable. It, it said we are adding 45 million dollars. We're not adding to the scope of work. We're, we just need additional funding. So here's how I liken it. You decide you want to redo your kitchen, you want a really nice fancy kitchen, and the contractor says, I'm going to do that nice kitchen for you for $50,000. you are going to get the stainless, you're going to get the granite, you're going to get all the pretty little things, right, for $50,000. Then he comes back to you and he says, well, ma'am, I'm really sorry. I'm, I'm going to build that same kitchen for you, but instead of $50,000, it's going to be $95,000 right and that you're not going to get anything different the same granite the same countertops everything else is the same I just need more money and that's what the supplement said we don't we're not adding to the scope of work we need additional funding so we went from 50 million to 95 million dollars and then we got several additional um, additions and the last count I had was that 50 million dollar maximum amount payable was at 131 million dollars this report, when we started working on it in the office, <coughs> we got all of the billings that David Evans sent to the CRC project office, 600 to 1,000 pages long each month. That's how detailed they were, <coughs> which is actually really good for us because it's a lot of information that we can um, assess. And this is when I realized this was not a political issue because some of the people that work in my office are on opposite ends of the political spectrum than I am. And they would call me and they'd say, Tiffany, do you have something else I can work on? Do you have a different client that I can work on? Because I can't believe what I see in these documents. And what we were seeing is we had task orders and change orders that were literally the same information, just a different date. So we got a change order this year, right? to do a specific amount of work, and the next year we say, oh, by the way, we're going to do this additional work. It's the same exact wording. The only thing we've done is changed the date. So we summarized um, a lot of, we, we basically showed that not only were we way off of budget on this environmental impact statement process, but we were showing uh, how much duplicate work that was going on and that the, the contractor, David Evans, was promising that all of these deliverables were going to be done at certain prices and by certain dates and all of them were way over budget and they were never delivered on time. And then the last thing we questioned was the uh, Washington State um, Contractor's Manual says when a contractor makes errors, you can claw that money back, right? And instead, what we were seeing, for example, when the bridge couldn't be built, we saw a bunch of other change orders so we could fix that. And so we were paying them more money to fix their mistakes. When the bridge was too low and we had to redo some things for the Coast Guard, we were seeing hundreds of thousands of dollars, up to uh, more than a million dollars of change orders to attend meetings and, and deal with the Coast Guard. And so uh, we were just indicating, hey, listen, that there's some federal uh, laws out here, there are some state laws out here, and we don't understand why these laws say this thing, and this is happening with the project office. We have a question here, we think it needs to be looked into in, in, uh, again. Report number three was all about the pretty little map, and I think I've got one in here. This one I found by accident one day, I did a Google search, on the project to find something else and I came across uh, something that was printed for the Federal Transit Authority and the Federal Transit Authority put it on their website. And the Federal Transit Authority is sitting here explaining what the project is going to do. And part of that was to, to extend TriMet's current maintenance facility at Ruby Junction 
and to approve uh, Portland Steel Bridge. None of that had been uh, reported to uh, the legislature. Nobody had told the legislature that we were going to fix uh, the steel bridge or that we were going to build something out in Gresham because they kept showing us a map with colors and the map was this five mile area between, um, I'm all mixed up, between Vancouver and Portland. So we started looking into it, figured out that the $50 million upgrade was for the facility in uh, Gresham that basically houses the light rail at night. But what we indicated and what we found is that the last two times they've either updated the facility or that they built it new, it was like 10, between 5 and $15 million. So I was questioning why is it $50 million? Portland M Milwaukee Light Rail is upgrading Ruby Junction for $16 million right now. So why are we now adding $50 million more for the CRC project? And why aren't we telling anybody about it? And I, I basically looked at some other facilities like in lo downtown Los Angeles where they were like buying land in downtown Los Angeles and building a brand new facility and it, even that wasn't $50 million. So I was questioning that. <coughs> and then, oh, I went through the testimony of the CRC uh, which we had on video, and I said, listen, here's what they told you during the meeting, and here's what the documents say, and those two things don't match. Report number four, I basically put the math together on the funding program. So they told, and I'll remember, I'm still under the guise that we have a, a two-by-state project, right? So I know I'm, I'm in hindsight right now, but at the time they told us, we have a $3.5 billion project. Each state's going to pay for half a billion. We're going to toll $1.2 billion, and we hope to have a billion dollars from the feds and half a billion dollars from a, pro a program from the feds that doesn't exist. And they said they hoped that, that program from the feds would come back. What they weren't telling us is that it really cost, it was a $5.5 billion project. Their own numbers spelled out the cost of the, the project to build was $3.5 billion, and that $2 billion was going to be for interest uh, to um, operate and maintain the bridge and to collect the tolls. So I'm looking at their, their plan, and their plan says it's a $5.5 billion project, but they'd only been telling us where the $3 billion was going to come from, right? So I dug into their financing plan, uh, which is all printed on their website, and uh, they actually did not plan to collect 1.2 billion in tolls. The plan was to collect 3.5 billion in tolls to, to pay for that $2 billion of interest, um, operate bridge operation and maintenance, et cetera. So report number four was explaining mostly to the local folks, especially those in um, Southwest Washington, if we take $3.5 billion worth of tolls out of the economy, what does that look like? Six months later, in March of this year, uh, they came up with a new tolling plan. And that tolling plan says, well, we're not going to collect $3 billion in tolls. We're going to collect between $6 billion and $10 billion in tolls. And instead of doing it over 30 years like we originally planned, we're going to extend that to 45 years. So I think it's really important to understand what is $6 billion worth of tolls, a minimum, look like to an economy, uh, a, 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 especially a local economy, where a lot of the locals are using that bridge on a daily basis. And so that's what report number four was. Report number five was sort of accounting heavy. Um, basically, I show up at work today as, a, as, a, as an employee of one of, say, David Evans, right? Today I'm an employee of David Evans, and tomorrow I'm an employee of David Evans. Tomorrow's a Friday. What I was reporting here was that on day, people were showing up at the same job in the same desk and suddenly they were their own contractor and um, instead of getting paid their wage, they were getting paid now as a, con a subcontractor and getting paid a lot of money. And I was questioning not only uh, why that was happening, but um, there's all kinds of IRS related rules as to whether you're an employee or a contractor and I was concerned that there were some issues there. There were several people, including Patricia McCaig, who ha did not have a license um, for a business in neither in Vancouver or the state of Washington. And 
We actually had somebody who was holding herself out as a certified public accountant, uh, and she didn't have a license, and so I was reporting on that as well. And then last but not least, <laughs> to me this was one of the most important ones. I think all of them are important in a certain way. I had asked for 18 months for a budget call. I kept saying I'd like a budget. They'd say, we don't have a budget. And I'd say, you have these pretty maps. They tell me that the cost is going to be $3 billion. You've got to have a budget that, that gets you to the $3 billion, right? I'm an accountant. That's how it works. And they kept saying, well, Ms. Couch, we don't have a budget. We don't have a budget. Long story short, I realized they had this thing called a base cost estimate. So I asked for the base cost estimate. It was a 33-page document that's so detailed that it tells me the linear feet of pavement they're going to pour at each individual um, interchange. It tells me the cost of all of those linear feet of pavement. It tells me how much um, each of the traffic cameras is going to cost. It tells me how much money is going to be spent for environmental mitigation. It is as detailed a budget as I have ever seen. So I put that budget together. And um, here's what I found. The cost of each of the interchanges, they were telling us, was $595 million on this side of the river and about $450 million on the Washington side of the river. Their budget indicated that the, wa the Oregon interchanges were closer to a billion dollars and the Washington interchanges were closer to about $800 million. They kept telling us that the bridge is going to cost $1.2 billion to tear down and rebuild. I think all of us kind of are aware of that number, and I'm happy to show you the map if you want it. Their actual budget shows that to tear down and build the bridge back up was about $690 million. They tell us that the cost of the light rail is about $850 million. Guess what? Their budget indicated the cost of the light rail was about $850 million. So I was right on on that number. So what I was finding is they were taking the costs of the overpasses of each of the interchanges, putting them, taking them out of cost of the interchanges, and reporting them as cost of the bridge. And so they were under um, reporting the cost of the interchanges to the legislature, and they were over reporting the cost of the, of the bridge to the legislator, legislature. And um, there's a significant potential impact to that. Why? Because the legislatures were asked to, being asked to each give half a billion dollars and then they were going to toll the cost of the bridge for 1.2 billion and basically I was saying if you're in Washington and you're driving over that that bridge you're helping Oregon pay for their interchanges and really vice versa. If you're sitting here in Hayden Island driving to Vancouver for work you're helping Vancouver pay for their interchanges. You weren't just paying for the cost of the bridge. And that's according to their budget. And here's some math, and I won't get into that. So because of the work that we did in closing, um, we had a couple of legislators who actually started realizing that what I was saying was not, was not crazy, right? They, they started asking questions based on what I was saying, and as they started doing their homework, they realized that what Tiffany was saying was actually true. And those legislators in Washington started getting together and between the bridge height issue, between the fact that we can't build the bridge, between some of the accounting issues that I brought up, um, they decided not to fund the, uh, wash or the CRC project in last year's um, legislative session. They've asked for a full forensic accounting which is being done by the state auditor's office right now. And you know there was just some lessons that I learned. Number one, I use their information every single time. Okay, it's their documents, here's what they are, here's what they say, let's just learn from what, what that information uh, tells us. Um, and I just realized, you know, I was always attacked based on who paid for my work, or, you know, I don't know, maybe because I had red hair, I don't know, right? Um, but nobody ever wanted to debate me on the facts. Nobody ever wanted to talk about what was inside all of those binders and all of those exhibits. And uh, I realized over time, you know what, Tiffany, there's a reason for that, right? There's a reason for that. And I'm always happy to debate people on the facts and give me more information if I'm incorrect. If I'm not incorrect, let's look into it a little deeper. So there's my contact information. I'm happy to ask more questions or answer your questions uh, after 
uh, Mr. Crandall uh, gives you their great alternatives. So. I have a oh. What did you find out in Washington? Oh, I already forgot about that, right? So I went to the American Dream Conference or American Dream Coalition Conference. They're all about sustainability and. Um, uh, you know, basically preserving the American dream. People are mobile and people have affordable housing. And they asked me to come and speak about the work we did. Basically, I gave them this same speech. And here's what I found. I met people from Hawaii and I met people from Wisconsin and I met people from f um, uh, uh, the, the Bay Area and uh, Florida. And I started talking to them about this. Or I started listening to their story. And here's what I found. The same vendors who are getting paid on the CRC project, like HDR or Parsons Brinkerhoff, are all getting paid in all of these projects around the United States of America. I learned that there are people here or in all of these places who voted this down multiple times, and that's very similar to what's happened at least on the Washington side of the river. And the bureaucrats, the people, the, the public officials found ways to get around those votes and push the projects through. In the areas where the projects went through, um, the ridership and the revenues and all of the things that were promised were never came to fruition and people lost bus service and lost all of the things that were really good about uh, the transit systems they had. And so I think for me at least, feeling you know, you're sort of in a bubble you're doing this here, right here in your own backyard, realizing some of the commonalities from every single part of the United States of America. I just thought that was really, really interesting. Um, and there were just a lot of really nice people that all looked like all of us, you know, trying to figure out, um, you know, what they could do to make an impact and be able to be mobile and still be able to provide transit service to people. Um, so I just found that to be interesting and really eye-opening. Tiffany, thank you very much. Uh, yep. You and Jim had uh, thought that uh, Q&A <laughs> Welcome back, folks. As you can see, it's, it's kind of like follow the money. And Tiffany will be back to give us an update in the future as to where we are in this whole issue of the CRC, and which was, again, uh, in addition to that, it's a major concern here at, at the island. Um, what we're going to do, we're going to go on and take a short break at this point in time, and then we'll come back, and then uh, we'll show you an alternative. Uh, I remember Ron Buell and Jim Howell uh, had made a pre presentation about an alternative as to this construction of a bridge that, by the way, that wasn't even mentioned on that first $180, $200 million, but you at least have some idea of, of someone who actually put together a project from a local perspective and, and, and the benefits and the, and the costs, okay? We'll take a short break and we'll be right back. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. I'm a substitute here tonight, and I'm not used to giving presentations, but uh, uh, hopefully hey, you'll uh, forgive me for that. Uh, <coughs> I, I think that's probably quite likely that this project, as currently designed, is not going to get built. Uh, every day you read more and more about the problems. And what I wanted to talk about is what 
could be done faster and at, at much lower cost. And uh, so uh, rather than talk about the existing project, I'm going to talk about what we're proposing here. It's called a common sense alternative two. It comes in two parts, the first phase and the second phase. I want to talk mainly about the first phase because it can be done for less than a million dollars. It can build a new freeway bridge and extend light rail to Vancouver. Uh, it would meet the project's uh, purpose and needs, which uh, have already been developed. It would cost less than a billion dollars, require both states to share in the cost and responsibility. It's not an Oregon only. The plan for no minimal federal funding, and I think they should plan for no federal money because the federal government is, is getting to the point where they're less and less likely to give you money to do it. And you really should figure out a way to do it with state and local funds. Uh, this would not require a toll because the toll to cost would be so much lower. Uh, it would not degrade the river navigation because it would have an opening span bridge, not a high bridge. Uh, and it can be done in phases, and actually the construction could start uh, by 2015. And it, it actually it would be about a five-year project instead of a six or seven-year project, as they're proposing. And it would uh, extend light rail to Hayden Island, and preferably to at least downtown Vancouver. So those are the kind of the political issues that uh, it had to be drive. Now I'm going to go into a little bit of what, what it is. It, this is <coughs> the common sense alternative two. The reason we call it the two instead of the original common sense alternative, which put in a, a local bridge between Hayden Island and Vancouver, this actually builds a freeway bridge and repurposes the existing bridges for uh, uh, public transit. And here are seven points to it, and I'll go through these thi these uh, in, uh, in more, am I in any way? Top of the laptop, if you yeah. could just pull yeah. yeah, I wasn't even looking at uh, So I'll go through these one by one. There's about seven, seven parts to it. <coughs> the first is what I think you folks finally got into the project, and that was the local access to Hayden Island, you know, it wasn't in the original design and you, they went through a process and, and finally agreed that you should have local access to uh, Expo Road and, and Bridgeton. And so what we're suggesting is pretty much that pr part of the project should be built. Maybe a little different engineering, but basically the same concept. The second part would be to build the light rail station on Hayden Island, but behind, besides having a light rail station, what you really need is a local bus line to feed to it. Just putting a station in the middle there, then you have a huge parking problem and tr around the station, but if you have a local feeder bus that meets the trains, then you have a system here that works, and since you have a long, narrow uh, island, it, it works fine. The uh, next part is to fix the railroad bridge. Now, the, the, this was recommended in the 90s, and it never got anywhere. I mean, they got approved by just every jurisdiction in the region, but they never met, went forward with it because the CRC came along and they said, well, maybe we don't need to move the uh, uh, and build a, a lift span on the local bridge, which, as you know, would eliminate close to 90% of all the lifts, openings of the bridge, because it's, it doesn't, uh, uh, are you all pretty, I, you folks that live here, you should know the, basically what that does. It, it eliminates the need for an S-curve that is, causes a lot of problems, especially in, in a high water line. So, uh, this is basically what the common sense alternative is. It's a low bridge, although it has a 72-foot clearance, which is the same as the existing bridge, uh, but it has a bascal draw span that lines up with the, uh, uh, with the existing lift span. And therefore, uh, 
it can be a much lower bridge and it does not require what is the most expensive part of this project and that's the interchanges on either end. And if you have any questions along the way, you just uh, I can answer them as I go. How far upstream? It is immediately upstream of the existing bridge. I mean, maybe 50 to 100 feet. Uh, now I'll show it in plan here. <coughs> the, this is the, the story was that oh we can't have an opening span on the freeway. You know it's impossible. The, the federal government won't allow it. Well, this one right here is a brand new freeway in Washington, D.C., on I-95. It was just opened three years ago. So that was clearly not true, that you can have opening spans on freeways. And they did it right there in their own backyard. <coughs> this is basically the alignment. It, uh, uh, first of all, I want to say there are about three things that this project would maybe you might consider negative impacts to the island. I don't consider them, but I'll tell you right up front. This would eliminate your on-ramps north to the freeway, but you would have a local bridge that gets you north. So, But you would not have the direct freeway access north. You'd still have it south. That, that I, I know, might be a, 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 and then the second thing, of course, is you're going to have an opening span, not a high-level span. So it will open once in a while, but not very often because of it, it fixes the railroad bridge. And thirdly, this does not include rebuilding the uh, interchange at, at uh, Marine Drive. Now, there, we know there's problems with backups at that interchange, but a lot of those problems will be solved in our second phase, which is uh, going in later on, but also having the local access to Hayden Island and the light rail, that will mitigate some of that traffic, not all of it. Obviously, you're still going to have some congestion. This is what they wanted to do to your community. Now, I, I <laughs> it, uh, it, it is huge. It would basically wipe out the whole center of, of your island. And a lot of it is because you have to have these, uh, uh, maybe I got a pointer here. Uh, you can see that a lot of these ramps are, are in order to get you onto the freeway north. Yeah. These ramps here, they, they take you north, and therefore they add, it adds another lane on the, on the bridge. Uh, the bridge that we're proposing is an eight-lane bridge, not a ten-lane bridge. You don't need that extra lane because you don't have those on-ramps. But you need a, a drop lane in order to interchange uh, with uh, SR-14. Uh, this is kind of... As you can see, the interchange on Hayden Island is over a half a billion dollars, just right there. And, the, and, and in fact, they've decided not even to do this connection, which I think all you folks wanted, was that, and they decided that it wasn't going to be done. Is that, are they going to do it? No, Would, no, everybody didn't want it. Oh, you did, oh, okay, I didn't know that. It wasn't you, Oh, okay. <laughs> I, uh, okay, I, I'm sorry. I didn't know there was a dispute on. But anyway, this this half a billion dollars doesn't include that. This is an earlier drawing. This is what we're proposing it would be a much simpler, and <coughs> it would not involve rebuilding interchange at all because that which is in blue is existing roadway, and you would just have a connection here to the old bridge, going on and. Uh, which I'll go into in a minute, and and uh, and the light rail station. So it's it's a fairly very simple, uh, and there's no uh, obviously you keep your Safeway store and uh, everything over here. Uh, <coughs> on the on the north side, on the Vancouver side, the big difference is 
the freeway, the new freeway alignment would go under the railroad fill instead of over it. And that's a big deal in Vancouver because their proposal uh, has it going over, as you can see here. And this means that, uh, and that, r that railroad fill is pretty high and then you have to clear the railroad by 23 and a half feet. And so by the time you get over that and then you have to get down to SR 14, what you have here is a huge climbing lane right in the downtown, probably five to six percent grade with trucks climbing right next to the downtown area. I mean, it, it, as far as Vancouver, it would be a disaster. And uh, I don't think anyone realizes, you know, the, the impact of that, that interchange. Where what, what I'm proposing here is basically existing interchange and you just, uh, in this, instead of squeezing onto a, a three lanes like it is today, you would have an add lane on there. That's that, for that extra lane. And, and therefore, this is designed as a freeway. It meets the freeway standards, but it's low. And you and have the to other thing is <laughs> it takes five years to construct that. So we would be out all the way up to 8th Street, uh, no on ramp or off, off <laughs> ramp for a period of five years. And they all have to be down at the same <laughs> time. It can't be done in sequential. You're absolutely right. I'll show that later on, okay. uh, the, the sequence of things. But uh, it would require some under, new underpass work under the railroad, but it keeps it simple. And that's the whole idea, is to keep the project simple so you keep the cost down to below the billion dollars. And this is, of course, their version. This is a ramp I was telling you about. And this, this drawing here basically is for the 95-foot clearance, and they were talking about going up to 116-foot. So th this ramp would even be steeper than they, they have shown there. This is the difference in the profile between the two alignments. There's is the, the blue line, and that here again, that's the 95-foot profile. Actually, 116 would even be higher. But we're talking about a much lower profile. This little bump here, since this is an exaggerated vertical scale on these uh, uh, profiles, it's not actual that way. This little bump here, that's the railroad fill. And, and they have to clear that and therefore it's much longer into Vancouver. And it's also not so much on Hayden Island. This is a cross section roughly of what you have because we'd be keeping the existing bridges and one of them would be used for local traffic, bikes and pedestrians, and the other one for light rail, buses, a cycle track, a real bicycle uh, way and pedestrians on both of them. So, we're, and you're saving $75 million by not tearing down the old bridges. You're using them, you're repurposing them. And this is just a simple, uh, th this type of structure is relatively cheap and is, is basically the same kind of structure they used to build the uh, uh, Jackson Bridge. It's single deck, not a double deck. It's straight, not curved and it, it only has a freeway on it, nothing else. And so this could be done at much lower cost. And uh, just to show you that this isn't a new idea, that's what used to be on that bridge when they built it. <laughs> so uh, the last thing was the light rail. Now, I'm a transit planner. And so I know something about what works and what doesn't as far as public transit. The way they've designed this public transit in Vancouver is an abomination. It is auto-oriented. It relies on close to 3,000 parking spaces that are going to cost $90,000 a piece, each space, and fancy in three structures. Uh, one structure at the college, I think, is going to have 1,900 parking. You don't build transit to attract people to drive into it. You basically build a transit system that works 
where the buses feed into the system and you, you transfer to to another mode and then you go in and that's that's why we're proposing a terminal station right here just as you get it into Vancouver you have the terminal station down here by Columbia Street and forth and the C-Tran then would feed their buses into it so it separates the two systems you got a C-Tran system they run buses TriMet runs light rail the folks over in Vancouver don't have to pay a dime for operating costs because it basically is not operating in, Van in Vancouver. So this would save a half a billion dollars or more uh, in public transit and you would have, in my opinion, a more effective system. Now I know some folks over in Vancouver don't like light rail at all, eh, but you could even stop the light rail in, in, on Hayden Island, but it, I think it would be best if it did have a connection over here. There's good examples of this throughout the world. You go up to Vancouver, North Vancouver, in Canada, they have a similar situation with their sea bus, where the sea bus crosses Burrard Inlet, and the North Vancouver buses come in, and they meet that ferry, and, and it, it works great, and thousands of people use it every day. This is just an example. This is from their, from the, their proposal. This is a uh, <laughs> The 1900 free parking spaces at the college and uh, and it's not the way to provide effective public transit this is what you were talking about and these are some of the <coughs> the closures uh, that would be required I think you were talking about uh, number eight SR 14 West the city center is going to be closed for five years and and SR 14 is closed for five years to the freeway, so they're going to have to detour for five years up to Mill Plain Boulevard. I mean, it's, I mean, it's and so, 205, huh? 205. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah, right, and you can go to 205 too, also, but it's, uh, they've made this project so complex, I mean, that's why they're justifying the $180 million they've wasted so far. Is because they were not trying to design something that was simple and works. And in fact, I was at the meeting in January of 04 when this, the first time any I heard this statement, this is a mega project. We're going to build a mega project in January of, of 2004. <coughs> they basically made up their mind that we're going to do a huge project. And they've basically, they shot the arrow at that time and they've been painting a bullseye around it ever since. So, if you have any questions, I'm glad I answered. Yes, Tom? Yeah. Welcome back, folks. Well, you've got the you got the opening, if you will, on the whole, on one of the issues uh, that, are, that are involved in Heaton Island. And, and I'm going to get a little response from Herman, but again, I take it, Herman, that the next issue that we're going to probably deal with is the lottery roll lottery situation, roll, yeah, right? Probably, It'll yeah. be very interesting because um, uh, the, the new director that has to be approved by the Senate is former state labor commissioner, uh, Jack Roberts. I'm sure you're familiar with uh, uh, Commissioner Roberts. I think it's some very interesting times there at the labor commission. <laughs> so it's going, to be, it's going to be a welcome. So what do you think on, that, on this first piece that we just talked about? Real well, quickly. you know, it's all extremely interesting information, and... I w would hope that some legislators would listen and see what that common sense alternative is, either the one or two. Take another look at this whole thing. The problem, I think, is going to be they've got so much money invested in promoting this one look at how to cross the river. Uh, it's going to be tough, I think, for get this thing turned around. Uh, certainly any way to reduce the economic impact on the community by cut doing a s less costly uh, project mm -hmm. has got to be a benefit you know um i don't the, the other part of this we've got lottery row coming up in the future right. as a right. topic uh the other thing is the west hayden island industrial development right. which is because tied in with the crc project because we need the for it to work we need the roads fixed on Hayden Island to work yeah. with that or yeah. put another bridge over from West Hayden Island over to Marine Drive mm -hmm. to take that freight traffic that way, whatever. You know, it's a complicated 
process they were going to be going through the next many years. Right. And the West Hayden Island thing is just getting looked at by the city council now. That's going to be in the next months into next year sometime. That'll get looked at. But uh, CRC is just, I don't know if it's dead or still alive. It's hard to say where they're at. It's still spending right. money. It's Oh, they're spending money. Yeah, <laughs> you got that right. They know how to do that. Well, you know, I think one of the things that we will be thankful for at this point this point in time also is the fact that um, we got the elections coming up. Yep. We got uh, one person who's running for, on the R side, uh, re re Representative, I think, Representative Dennis Richardson. Yeah. He's running for governor. And I'm sure he'll be receptive to dealing with this issue. Right. And then we got, um, uh, well, governor, our present governor, uh, uh, Kitzhopper, right? Yep. And uh, he hasn't announced yet, but I'm thinking they're saying that he's going to probably run. And oh, so, I would think so. So yeah. hopefully we'll have that, them to have some input and, and right. hopefully share this information with them at this right. point in time. Yep. And the same thing with Lottery Row across yeah. the board. And then the congressional delegation. Oh, the, the, the congressional. Oh, there's, yeah. there's some new runs there. They got the Senate right. race there, and and they've got the congressional races in some cases. And and I think it's really great that that's happening. And so mm -hmm. guess what? They'll be right at the forefront. We're still talking about other people's money. Oh, yeah. Right? OPM, oh, other right? People. Other people. Other people's money. Yeah. I.e. the voters, right? The voters. Well, is I'm, their I'm money. retired and disabled. I don't have any money. That's so. right. I, it's all gone. <laughs> <laughs> you may not have Medicare. You're very <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, thank you very much for joining us. And then share this with your friends. You, you saw the repeats, if you will. And I'll see you next week with another very, very interesting show. Take care and have a good one.